Edward Lawrence uh, was running a numerical computer weather model to redo a prediction uh, from the middle of the previous month model. So Lawrence entered an abbreviated condition value of 0 0.506 from the printout instead of entering the full value of 0.506127. Now, for those of you who are mathematicians, that is a very small difference. As it turns out, the result of the weather model was, compl was a completely different weather scenario. The year was 1961. They had computers in 1961. Who knew? And Lawrence had stumbled upon what is known today as the butterfly effect. The butterfly ef effect refers to the idea that a butterfly's flapping uh, of the wings might create tiny changes in the atmosphere, and that that may ultimately alter the path of a tornado. The, the flapping of a butterfly's wings might create tiny changes in the atmosphere that may delay or may accelerate or even prevent an occurrence of a tornado in another location. So to be clear, the butterfly in itself does not have the power to create a tornado. Uh, the butterfly itself essentially is a part of, of a set of initial conditions, and those initial con conditions can then change with a surprising outcome. The flapping of the wings of a butterfly represent a small change in the initial conditions of a system which can cascade, which can turn into a large scale acceleration of events. Now, had the butterfly not flapped its wings, it's then possible that that whole scenario would not, in fact, happen. In short, a small change here can create a big change here. It's with this idea of the butterfly effect, of small things having a big and surprising outcome, that I want to turn to our scripture this morning from Matthew chapter 13, 31 through 34. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Jesus told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it worked through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables, and he did not say anything to them without using a parable. So I went out and bought some mustard seeds yesterday. I actually went to Lowe's Garden Center. Guess what? You can't find mustard seeds there. Uh, you can tell I don't, pay, I don't spend a lot of time in the kitchen because it turns out that you can get these at the grocery store. So uh, I'm going to pass these around. Um, really, really small seeds, people. If you look at them, you, I mean, this is where I think God as creator is... is, is in many ways miraculous because you look at a, a mustard seed and you think, what kind of potential is in that? Um, and uh, I've shared with you before, I've had experiences of hiking uh, where I have walked into fields of mustards that were was overhead. Um, in the same way, um, I went out and bought some yeast. Now, when I open this, it's, can I do this? It's It's like a powder. It's it's like beach sand. Pass that around. Again, how can yeast make such a big difference when it's added to dough? So I have a question for you. What if Jesus had not come? What if Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, God in the flesh, had not come? Remember, no small change here means there's not going to be a change over here. Truth is, God did send his son. When, we, when he first heard about Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel's initial reaction was, Jesus of Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? 
Nazareth was considered a backwater village from far from any place that had any significance, far from any people that would have any influence. But 2,000 years later, even secular historians cannot ignore Jesus' consequential influence. H.G. Wells, of all people, is quoted as saying, Jesus is easily the dominant figure in history. A historian without any theological bias whatsoever should find that history cannot portray the progress of humanity honestly without giving a foremost place to the penniless preacher from Nazareth. If there was an ever a poster child of the phrase from zero to hero, Jesus is it. Jesus is the greatest example of his own parable, the parable of the mustard seed, a parable about exceeding expectations. So it's with these thoughts this morning that I'm inviting up Jackie Hosklaw and a little later, um, Gail Luker. They're going to share with us some stories from the, their trip to Uganda in July. And I want you to be listening to their stories, but I also want you to be keeping this idea of the butterfly effect. Something small happening here, creating surprising outcomes over here. So at this time, Jackie Hosklaw. Waybele, Waybele, thank you, thank you for once again helping us go on this amazing trip. Um, so up on the screen is a picture of our, the route that we took from LAX to Uganda. So first it was a 16-hour flight from LA to Dubai, and the next day was a five-hour flight from Dubai to Entebbe, followed by a very very long, three-hour drive um, to Weyunga, which was the village that we were staying in. As you can see, um, Uganda is on the eastern side of, of Africa, and it is just north of Lake Victoria. So Lake Victoria, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous right now. My voice is shaking. Um, <laughs> um, Lake Victoria is where the Nile starts from, and Jinja, which is a relatively large city, is very close to the village we stayed in, and that is where the Nile starts, and it's called the source of the Nile. Um, Uganda is south of Sudan, east of the Congo, north of Rwanda, and, and west of Kenya, pretty much halfway down the continent. So that gives you a good picture of where Uganda is in that continent. Um, and just so you have an economic perspective, the annual earnings per pl person in Uganda is about $660. Yeah, just think about that. It's crazy. Um, as many of you know, this is my second, was my second trip to Uganda. And I have to be honest and say I wasn't quite sure why I was going back, but God made it very clear to me while I was in country that I was there for a reason. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard that it's all about relationships. Well, this trip, God helped me understand this in a whole new way. In our time in Uganda, a lot of relationships were started, while others were made deeper. Um, God blessed me with deepening um, two very special relationships with two very special people. One of those is a young girl named Rachel, who I connected with two years ago. And there she is up on the screen. Isn't she beautiful? Um, I believe then she was about seven or eight years old. This two years ago. And before I left two years ago, I decided I needed my own po poster child, if you will, so that when I prayed for the children at Dayspring, I would have one face that came to mind. So I took her picture on my phone, and it is now the background on my phone. And that honestly helps me remember to pray for the children in Uganda and at Dayspring School. I didn't want to set myself up for disappointment, so I really didn't expect to see her at the school. But the very first class that we helped out in, there she was sitting in the front row. And I was shocked. I was, just couldn't believe it. And I just an amazing gift from God. Um, so throughout the whole time we were there, any opportunity we had, 
she would come and hold my hand and we would sit together while we watched the boys play um, soccer, what they call football, and it was very, very special. I also reconnected with Philip, who is George and Stella's nephew that lives with them. And that's him on the left-hand side. Um, he is 23 years old, is in the worship team, obviously, um, at their church, and has gone to school for music and music production. So he's very similar to my son Tyler, who is 24, a musician, and also has a great love for music. So we joke that he is now my Ugandan son, and I am his American mom. We grew so very close during those two weeks that it was just really, really hard to leave. Um, I was also very excited, thinking we were going to start digging on the foundation of the new medical clinic. I think we're all excited about getting our hands dirty and really pe being a part of the construction of the clinic. George said that we were going over to the property, but we weren't going to dig. We were going to pray. So we get over to where the medical clinic is going to be built. We sat down next to a pile of rocks, and ironically, there's a bed of impatient flowers right next to the rocks. Then George shares with us that God had told him that the rocks are representative of the bones in the story in the book of Ezekiel. And if you're familiar with that story, God raises up what the Bible says is, is a whole house of Israel from a pile of dry bones. George said, just as the bones came to life, so will the clinic. So as we're sitting there, I look over to where, I look over to where the um, school is, and I saw the building that's a, a team just like us. And this picture that's on the screen now is a team, including Miss Gale. Um, what year was this? So this was in 2005. And they're praying over a empty piece of land, obviously, for a building to be built. So that's what we're doing for the clinic. Um, so just as we prayed over many years ago, now there stands this wonderful building. So the next picture is a picture exactly where they were praying. So that's the building that um, was constructed. And you'll hear more about that later. Um, so God was telling me not to feel frustrated or insignificant or impatient, but to know that our praying and our building of relationships is what the foundation of this clinic is going to be built on. Um, I understand that we are not going to be the ones to actually build the clinic, but without relationships and prayer, the clinic doesn't have a hope. It will be built, but it will be built with the help of our financial funding in God's perfect timing. In the past, because of our continuing building of relationships over the years, Stonebridge has raised the funds to help build the school, paid for countless numbers of uh, children's tuition, purchased school uniforms for many of the students, and okay, where am I? raised all the money to have a well dug on school property, so there should be a picture of, no, there we go. That's the well, that's George um, on the well there. It doesn't look like much, but it, it gives water to the whole community of the school there. And without that, they have to go elsewhere, which takes away from all of their learning and everything. So it's a really big deal. Um, and then the next picture is a bus that we, we um, there we go, with all those beautiful children. Um, so that's just some of the big stuff, and a lot of these needs are ongoing. I strongly believe that God is faithful and that the funds that um, will be raised to build the medical clinic as well. The difference in our medical care is night and day. In Uganda, not only is the care substandard, but as in the case of this village, the nearest clinic at this point is about eight miles away, and most of the people have to walk and add on to that that there's a lot of corruption that goes on in the medical um, whatnot. Um, once the new medical clinic is, oh, there should be a picture. Yes, there it is. That is a picture of a delivery room at a clinic that we went and visited. Um, and that black thing is, is water. Um, so if you want to have your child delivered at the clinic, you have to bring all your own supplies, which includes 
scissors, towels, you know, a bucket, anything you need, you need to bring it, and then they'll help you. Um, so our clinic will be more than that. Um, and then I don't have a picture of it, I wish I did, but this, the one thing that just always comes to my mind when I think of the clinic is their sterilization. There's this little thing on the floor standing about this high, and it's a little dented up metal pot with a little burner underneath. And that's how they sterilize their tools, their medical tools. It's like crazy. Um, once our new medical clinic is in place, it will impact generations of students, their families, and the community. Not only will they have a much better chance at surviving childhood diseases and living, but they will be able to thrive and be part of the positive change for their community and their country. It is humbling to be part of something so big and so important in the lives and futures of these wonderful children. Thank you. Uh, as Jackie said, Webele Neo, thank you very much for supporting us um, through all the years in sending teams to Uganda to continue our relationship with Dayspring community. Um, it's not, not without you and your prayers and your support that we would be able to do this. So we thank you very much for that. Um, what I'm going to share with you is a picture of. So what you, if I ask you what you see here, most of you would say you see a pile of rocks. But I tell you, I see something much bigger. But more on that later. I want to share with you my story and my journey. So back in 1992, I was a single mom as a waitress, working just to survive and provide for my daughter. And I w wanted something bigger and better for her, obviously, like most um, parents do. They want something better for their children. So I started thinking, maybe I'll go back to school. So when she was at school, I started taking some classes to become an EMT. I got my EMT and got a job as a nurse's assistant at UCLA back in 93. And so I was working there for a little while, and then I'm thinking I want to do something even bigger and better. And I was thinking I want to kind of see the world as well and uh, maybe go to nursing school. But how was I going to go to nursing school? I didn't have the means to provide for my daughter and go to nursing school. So I thought maybe I'll join the Peace Corps. Now, who in their right mind wants to drag their little child around the world um, and do these kind of things, but apparently I did. So I was thinking of joining the Peace Corps. I had the application, I went through the process. Back then it wasn't online or anything. So I found um, on campus at UCLA actually, a uh, application. So I had that sitting on my desk for a little while. But God had other plans for me. Because then I met my husband, Mark. And as you know, when a girl meets a boy, life changes quite considerably. So. Mark and I um, started dating, and we ended up blending our families together. And I started nursing school here in the States and completed nursing school in 96. Mark and I got married. Our families were blended. And then we decided we needed to buy a home and, and just settle down as a family. So we found a house here in Simi. We moved here in 97. And then we wanted to also, we weren't going to church or anything, but we wanted to provide our child's our children with um, a religious foundation of some sort. So we realized that was lacking in our lives. So we started church shopping, and lo and behold, we found Stonebridge Community Church. We started coming here in 97 and have been coming since. Um, but now I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So, you know, we grew in our faith, obviously, but um, I'm going to fast forward to 2004. So in 2004, our youngest daughter, Cheryl, went on an impact trip with Eric Zuliga and Lor Lorna Mo Mosier. And uh, when they came back, uh, Cheryl shared a story about a little girl named Peace. And there she is, Cheryl and Peace. And she was about four, five, four or five in this picture. And so Cheryl came back and shared her story about Peace. And through that story, we took up here at Stonebridge a special offering for Peace to be able to go through um, and be educated because she is the third child. She is actually George's, and some of this has been shared before in the past, but for those who don't know, Peace is George's niece, and she's the youngest of three children, and she's a female. She's the only female in the family. So at this time, back in 2004, it was very difficult for a third child and a, and a girl child to be educated. 
So through the story that Cheryl shared, we took up a special offering, and those funds have been used to be able to educate Peace through all these years. And she is still going to school. We still support her through that fund, and she's now in middle school, and what, or secondary school, they call it, and wants um, to be, go into the medical field as well. So Cheryl also, uh, in, on a personal note, kept sharing stories with us at home. And then she, every, I can't remember the stories very well, but all I could remember is, oh, Mom, you got to go. Oh, Mom, they really want to meet you. Oh, you, Mom, you would really love it there. So in 2005, I went on my very first impact trip. I got to meet, pers meet Peace personally, and there's a picture of her and I. And so as soon as I set foot in Uganda in 2005, it captured my heart. Um, there's no words besides that that can explain how a seed was planted in my heart for Uganda. So um, in 2005, I got to learn a little bit about the culture. I, I started my relationship with George and Stella. And in 2007, I ended up being a leader on an impact team back to Uganda. And in 2007, so we retur I returned, and we started um, working, as Jackie showed in 2005, our team had prayed on some empty land for an administration building for the school. And in 2007, when we returned, we found out we would be working on the foundation of that building. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, it's probably gonna be this one level building, no problem. And when we got to the site and saw the rebar wires that were so long, we knew it wasn't gonna be a one-story building. So we worked on that, and it's a couple more slides. This is just peace throughout the year. She's, this is 2010, and the next one is this past year, 2015. That's peace and I. But the fall, next picture is 2007. So this is part of the foundation we started working on in 2007 for the administration building. So we realized, oh, this is going to be a much bigger building than I even expected in the, when 2005 over empty land. And already in 2007, this is what it looked like. So then, you know, we come back home and we think, I'm thinking to myself, as a nurse, at this point I was a nurse, I'm thinking to myself, this school is growing quite considerably. And they have no medical means close by, and they do have boarders that are staying there. So how, how do we meet that need? And so I'm thinking to myself, it's, it's already seated in my mind, how can I help them be able to provide medical, basic medical care to their student population there, and maybe a little bit in the surrounding areas. And knowing and seeing how big this building is, realizing that need is going to be a little greater than I first expected. So I come back home, and then a few years go by, and I realize Impact isn't sending teams to Uganda anymore for different various reasons. So I didn't feel comfortable not continuing that relationship with George and Stella in the school, that those people never left my heart. God kept putting it on my heart that we needed to continue our relationship with them for, and as you will see later, why. So I, um, I went to our session and asked if we at Stonebridge could send a team directly to George and Stella since we already had a relationship established with Peace in funding her schooling. So lo and behold, we did. We sent a team in 2010, our very first team. It was myself, Mark, Lauren Swink, and we know what, how her life has changed because of these trips, uh, Jack Weed, and Kevin Brogy from Ventura, um, Ventura Church. So we went in 2010, and we got to work on this administration building now was this big. So now I really saw how big it was going to be. So not only was it just two stories, it's going to be three stories. So in my mind, I'm thinking now it really is going to matter having not just a nurse, maybe a, a medical nurse on campus, but maybe we can take one of these rooms and have it be, you know, a little nurse's office kind of situation. So I came home trying to figure out how I was going to have that conversation with George, because at this point, he still didn't know exactly what this building was going to encompass fully. But as you can see, his vision was quite big. So we came back, and I was thinking to myself, ah, oh, what? This is much bigger than I expected. But you know what? I'm going to be faithful and just continue to pray. So in 2013, we sent our second team back to Uganda, and that was with Pastor Jonathan, myself, uh, Midge, and Jackie, and um, who was our fifth person? And Mark. 
Like, like wait, oh yeah, Mark, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> the one that changed my whole life, the whole, that sent me on this path in the first place. Um, so, when we were, so when we were there, uh, George informed us that they had purchased the property next to the school to build the secondary school. Now, it's the, the vision is even bigger. I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to have it? Now, I, they definitely need some kind of medical help with all this growth. So I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to have this conversation with George and be culturally sensitive to his needs and his wants? And he turns to me and actually says, Gail, I want you to build a clinic. Now, I was just floored. I'm thinking to myself, what? Oh, here I am thinking, how am I going to have a conversation of maybe having one room in that administration building? And he wants me to build a whole clinic. So, of course, in my foolishness, I say, of course, yes, George, we can build you a clinic. And then I'm thinking, then I come home and I realize, how am I going to do that? That's going to take a lot of funds. How are we going to get those funds? How are we going to fundraise for it? What's the proper path to take for that? And I just kept praying and... and Time and time again, God kept putting a couple scriptures um, in my path, always. And it was Joshua 1.9, uh, 1, and it said, Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For I am your Lord God and will go with you wherever you go. So I was like, okay, that's cool. That's good. Okay, I, can, I get that scripture, but how? How is this going to happen? So I went to work one day, and one of my coworkers, who is a believer as well, said, Gail, I have to talk to you for a minute. And I said, yes. And she said, well, I was at this seminar, and I thought of you for some reason, <laughs> God, in his wonderful ways. She gives me a book that says How to Start a Nonprofit. She said, I just thought of you, and I thought, I know that you have this you know, desire to do something greater in Uganda, and you were mentioning maybe building a clinic, but you, know, you didn't know how, so she said, I just thought of you when you had this. So she gave me this book on how to start a nonprofit. So lo and behold, that's the ste next steps I take. So I start my nonprofit. I, I, I do all the application process, and they tell you it takes about 12 to 18 months before you get approved. So I was thinking, okay, well, I'll just wait. And then every now and then you get a little discouraged, and that scripture kept coming up. Do not be discouraged. I've commanded you. I will be there. Don't worry. So I was like, okay, God, I'm trusting you. So I've, over the time, I've advertised a little bit about my nonprofit, and some friends and family members have donated, and I got a whole $963 in my balance. So I was like, woohoo! So, but I, I know it's going to take a lot more than that to build a clinic. So in 2015, Another, our team went again this past time, and in preparation for that, knowing that we were going to build a clinic and things of that nature, I sent George an email and I said, oh, George, I know you've had an architect d uh, make some basic designs of what the clinic should look like. Do you have any of that for me? And he said, sure. So he emails me this picture of this, and I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> okay. I'm thinking this is the school, and I'm trying to figure out, I'm like, where is, which room is going to be the clinic? So when we get there, I said, oh, George, you sent me that picture. You know, what, which part of this is the clinic? He said, that is the clinic. I was like, what? So once again, I was knocked on my butt thinking, I'm one little room, one little building, and no. So George's vision is to have this be a two-story clinic. It's going to have, he wants a dental office, an eye clinic, some, a surgical suite, things of that nature. So it's not only going to meet the needs of the students at, at Dayspring, but also the surrounding community that they serve. So I'm like, okay, God, now you really need to help me, because how is this going to happen? So this last trip, George was able to share with me all the costs and things of that nature to actually build this building. And Converting it from shillings to American dollars, it's going to cost about $200,000 to build this clinic. And that includes having plumbing and electrical um, wiring so that we can have a lab. Oh, yeah, and a laboratory. He wants a lab in there so we don't have to send it out. So for all those different types of things, just for the, the labor, the supplies, and all that, it's about $200,000 um, American dollars. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm leaving it up to God. It's just amazing what in George's um, enthusiasm and faithfulness is contagious. 
obviously, because I keep saying yes to him. So, and, and in fact, saying yes to God. But um, I have to say that I have been direct witness and part of what God will do with very little materialistic things, but with people with great faith. I stood on empty ground that's now a three-story administration building, and I know that this building will eventually be erected as well. So I just want to show you one more picture that I started with. I asked you what you, you may have seen, a pile of rocks. What I see is a clinic. I thank you very much. Did you hear what I guess I got to hear? You look at those mustard seeds, and I hope they got passed around. You look at the yeast, and when you look at it, it looks so insignificant. Uh, I think, you know, if, who, who cares for these little things? Who, you know, if you, if you carried it in your hand, you would eventually lose it. Who's caring for that? Is there any potential in this little thing? And yet God doesn't say the kingdom of heaven might be like a mustard seed. He, he doesn't say, well, someday in the future, the kingdom of heaven could be, maybe. It's a truth that Jesus taught, that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And so we shouldn't be surprised to see God at work in our community of faith, that God is using our community of faith to influence a community of faith on the other side of the world to help provide Christian education for children that will influence, as those children grow up, influence their communities and influence their families and influence their country, that God would um, plant a seed in th these women's hearts. Um, Jackie raises the, the question, you know, what is the significance of these relationships? But then we recognize that cornerstone of that clinic is Jesus Christ. And I love what she said, that, that the foundation of that clinic is relationships and prayers. And that God has planted that seed and planted, planted that seed and vision uh, in George. And George just, um, in the same way a farmer nurtures the soil, <laughs> George just nurtures a vision and shares it. And it's turning into something bigger and bigger and bigger. But I asked the question earlier, what if God had not sent Jesus? What if our church had not sent some student missionaries to Uganda in what, 2006, 2004? What if we hadn't done that? See, the flapping of a butterfly's wings over here has a surprising influence over here. The flapping of angels' wings over here can have a huge influence over there. It's not just their story, it's our story. We are a community of faith, and this is what God is doing in our midst. We look at a, a little seed, that little mustard seed, and perhaps uh, you think, what good am I? And maybe... Um, your uh, self-esteem, your self-worth is, is as small as a mustard seed. This story is a story of hope and a, a story of encouragement and affirmation. Who cares for this little seed? God does. And inside that little seed, there is tons of potential. Who are you in the hands of God? God is caring for you. God knows where you need to be to be able to influence and change the world that you live in for his kingdom.